The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, John said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy even to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. If you had lived in A.D. 30 instead of A.D. 2022, you would know all about the temple that was in Jerusalem. You would know that it was the center of the people of God, that it was the center of worship, that it was the center of commerce, it was the center of the monarchy, it was the center of literacy and culture, of art and governance, it was the center of religious training, it was the center of liturgical celebration, and it was also the center of the world, if not the universe, because this is where God, by his own admission, dwelt. Of course, the opposite is also true. The further you move away from that center, from the temple, from Jerusalem, the further you move away from God. So by the time you reach John the Baptist, preaching his heart out on the banks of the Jordan, you're just about as far from the center as you can be. Now you're into arid spaces, the wilderness, the habitation of scorpions and jackals and unclean spirits. It begs one very important question. Why is John out there? If the Baptist is tasked to prepare the way of the Lord, why is he in the desert instead of the temple? That's the focus of the homily. Now, whatever else you may think of John, his eclectic wardrobe, his simple diet, or his pastorally blunt manner, remember, he's somebody that Jesus knows is related to, receives baptism from, and speaks highly of. No one is greater in the kingdom of God than John. John is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy given some 500 years before. He is the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. It's hard for moderns, us moderns, us postmoderns, 
to wrap our minds around a 500-year-old prophecy. We're citizens of a country that's 155 years old. We're a people of instant everything, whether it's food, information, communication. I get impatient waiting five minutes in the grocery line. Can you imagine waiting 500 years? But Israel is a nation who relies on her prophets to guide her. And Isaiah's 500-year-old prophecy, it's now here. So droves of people venture into the wilds to hear John. Why? Because he's the real deal. He's the genuine article. And they are thirsting No, they are starving for a prophet. John is fulfilling Isaiah's words. But why isn't he doing it in the temple? Traveling from the temple to the Jordan is at best a 50-kilometer trek on foot, perhaps longer. It's not an accidental journey. And there's no amenities along the way. There's no restaurants. There's no Airbnb. There's no ATMs. There's no Circle Ks. And there's nowhere for you to plug in your Tesla. John's message, it's clear. It's concise. Repent. The word repent has received some bad press in recent years, but its meaning is simple enough. Turn from one way, one direction, into another way, to a godly direction. The absence of preaching on repentance has led some to think, well, maybe it's no longer necessary. Maybe it's no longer relevant. One person recently asked me, aren't we beyond that now? Commit to memory the words of John Stott. The church is not full of sinners. It is full of repentant sinners. Repentance is the first step in restoring our friendship with God. Repentance opens the door of God's grace to heal our wounds. I draw your attention to the root word penance used in the word repent. It's why confession is properly called the sacrament of penance or reconciliation. John is preaching a baptism of repentance in the desert, but shouldn't he be preaching in the temple? The temple in Jerusalem, it's constructed of massive white hand-hewn stones, they gleam in the sun like glaciers. The outer court is lined with portico after portico after portico. Thousands pass through them every day. And as you move inward, your eyes are drawn to these very high gates and then some chambers where there's storage and priest quarters. A semicircular staircase leads you further inward and upward into the main court. Hundreds of worshipers fill it. Beyond the court lays the sanctuary. Priests are in vestments and they minister at the ancient stone altar that sits there. On each side of the altar are these enormous copper lavers full of water used for ablutions. And in front of them, there is a steady stream of pilgrims with their animals ready to make sacrifice. Finally, behind the altar, you catch sight of pillars that are so tall that they scrape the bottom of heaven. The pillars guard the entrance of the innermost chamber of the temple, the Holy of Holies, where God himself dwells. Folks, the glory of God is indeed in the temple. I've taken pains to try to say that, but understand this, the history of Israel is in the desert. Israel's greatest moments are in the desert. They are not in the temple. 
It's in the desert that God reveals himself to his people. He gives them the law. He carves out the commandments. He makes covenant with them. It's in the desert that Elijah and Elisha do battle for Yahweh. It's in the desert that King David conquers the enemies of Israel. And it's in the desert that the children of Israel make a 40-year sojourn into the promised land. So, by the time John arrives on the scene to announce Messiah fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy, it's not a big shock that he's doing it from where? The desert. But understand this. The desert is both a physical place and it is also a spiritual place. The desert represents the dry, the arid places of life, the brittle and the broken places of life, the bruised and the battered places of life. The desert is where you are when you lose your secure job. The desert is where you are when a close friendship dissolves. The desert is where you are when you receive a life-threatening diagnosis or your spouse passes. The desert is where you are when your heart aches for a wayward son or daughter. The desert is where you are when you feel the strain of not being able to pay your bills or the betrayal of a family member. Have you ever been to the desert? More like, have any of us not been to the desert? Faithful of Holy Redeemer, God may indeed dwell in the grandeur of the temple, but he knows that life is lived in the desert. And so that's where he comes to us. He comes and he stoops down and he picks us up and he presses us against himself and he says, I've got you. You're mine and I will not let you go. Never do we need Jesus more than when we are in the desert. So for a short time, we walk in the desert, but soon enough, we will dwell eternally in the temple of God. Welcome to Advent.